Well, the Headstock Music and Mental Wellbeing Festival continues now with a conversation with British boxing legend Ricky the Hit Manhattan. Ricky, great to see you. Good to see you, Mike, as always. We're talking today in your very own gym in Hyde. Uh, as a young kid growing up just a stone's throw from here, was this always the dream one day to have your own place? I suppose it was in many ways. I, um, from a very <coughs> young age, um, I was always surrounded by gyms. I did kickboxing and I played you know, football and then I went on to... To boxing, but I always wanted to be a world champion, you know, um, um, and I was able to, to to do that unbelievably several times over. And then when I retired from boxing, I had to think, what what am I going to do for my job now? And I always wanted to uh, to probably be a boxing coach and pass on my knowledge and try and give someone the same, you know, you know, wonderful things I've got through uh, through boxing. And I've been able to to do that. And I mean, I was like you said, I only I only through I only lived. Um, just, just matter, matter a couple of miles down the road I was born on Hattersley Estate. I've always been proud of me, me roots, and if I ever was going to have a gym, it was going to be uh, in my hometown. Yeah, so it's lovely to come to work every day. It makes me feel very, very proud. It's quite a swanky gym. This, when you look back at some of the places that you trained in back of the back in the day, nowhere near as luxurious as this. There were sort of basements of pubs and disused squash courts yeah. and old mills yeah. with mould on the walls. What was it back then that motivated you to get up every day and head into those places to graft? I don't know. It's just... Um, I've always been a boxing fan from a very, very young age. I always used to watch all the champions of old, all the great fighters, all the tapes. And um, and the minute I had my first fight, you know, I mean, you've got to be a strange individual to get, you know, to get hit on the nose and think, oh, I like that, let's do it again, you know. But it, it worked for me. And... Uh, uh, yeah, something I always, always took to me boxing, and um, there's something about when you've won that first fight, you train so hard. Even, even as an 11 year old, you wouldn't when you first fight, you train so, so, so hard, and to have your your hand raised, you know, you're in that ring and all the crowds clapping, and you're on your own. It's 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 uh, very, very addictive. As hard as it is boxing, don't get me wrong, it is very, very addictive to, for you once you've. Uh, you're in the middle of the ring and you get all that adulation, you on your own, like you've done it. It's uh, it's very addictive and I think that's why so many boxers uh, don't know when to hang them up. Because once you've had that feeling, it's very hard to say goodbye to it, yeah. Yeah, and you had that feeling so many times, yeah. your arm raised so many times. Just talk us through two or three of your personal career highlights. Um, my career highlights, I think, uh, without doubt, I've done, very, I've done so many... Great with it. At 18 years of age, I got to box at Madison Square Garden, which was the mecca of world boxing. You know what I mean? And that was when Nassi Hamed boxed Kevin Kelly. As an 18-year-old, I got the chance to box on an un on the undercard. Um, I also uh, my, my greatest ever win was the night I beat Costa Zoo in, in in Manchester, where you know 20,000 you know fans in Manchester at two o'clock in the morning, uh, and not just to beat. But not just to win a world title, to beat the number one in my weight division and the number one pound for pound. It was uh, it was something that no one ever thought I could do. And to make such a formidable champion quit on his stool and say, Ricky, leave me alone, no more, please, <laughs> was was brilliant. And then, you know, fans like the City of Manchester Stadium, 1,000, 58,000 fans, you know, tickets were sold in three weeks. It's incredible stuff. And 40,000 fans going over to Mayweather. There's been so many... Uh, Wonderful times from the from the little kid from Hattersley Council Estate. It's been uh, it's really great and uh, really great. And I like to, I think I brought a lot of uh, you know good times to people in the area. You know, good good times to look back on. The fans adored you. The celebrities loved you as well. I'm just going to mention a few of the names that just wanted to be your friend, wanted to be in the dressing room with you before fights. David Beckham, Wayne Rooney, Tom Jones, Russell Crowe. And Liam and Noel Gallagher, I mean, the night that they led you into the ring must have been very memorable. It was, yeah, because um, we've, um, they've been my friends for a number of years. And I always asked them, would they be able to carry the belts? And they never got the chance to ever do it because they were either working or gigging or just very, very busy, as you can imagine. But uh, ever since I was a young lad, you know, I wanted to be a world champion, support Manchester City and listen to Oasis. And then when I got the chance for them to finally carry the belt in, it was something special. It was when I fought Paulie Malinaji in Las Vegas and they both come in with the belts. And it's some of the, the pictures that, you know, just on the wall over there, it's, you know, it's, it's one of the best pictures that uh, I have. And they were Manchester lads. Just done well, council state lads from Manchester done well at their own profession, obviously singing and likewise. When so then that's why we could got on so you know got on on so well 
with each other because we could relate to each other where we come from, how hard it was in the beginning and that. And uh, no, it brilliant. It was a very, very special, special night for me. I probably beat better people than Paulie Malinaji, but that's one that really stands out in my mind because the boys finally got their chance to, to carry the belt in that night for me. When all of a sudden you're mixing with big name celebrities like that, it'd be very easy to let the fame go to your head, but you always appeared to remain very grounded. Uh, is that why you think you were so popular with members of the public? I think so. I think people, you know, used to like my my style of fighting. I was very aggressive, very attacking. You know, a, you know, a good body puncher, and I think they also liked me because um, it doesn't matter, you know, who, who they were. You know, Floyd Mayweather, Manny Pacquiao, Costa Zoo. You know, you know, I was advised not to fight him, but I did. Uh, and I think people like that. I was up in weight, down in weight, and I think they. When they come and supported me, they felt like they were supporting one of their own rather than just just a you know a local Manchester boxer who's who's fighting for world titles. I think they could see because of the way I held myself. I'd never knocked a picture back. You know, in, in all me all my years of being asked for for pictures, I've never knocked one back. Do you know what I mean? I, life has changed so much for Ricky Hatton, but I don't think I've changed a too great deal. You know, my gym's five minutes from where I was born and Hattersley, my local's still on Hattersley and in, in Hyde. Do you know what I mean? I've still got the same mates that I went to school with and, um, you know, people see that. You can't fool the public and I think they saw that when they come and supported me, they were supporting just one of us, a local lad, um, done well. And I think that's why I, uh, I was, I'd like to think that's why I was like so much, yeah. By the time you beat Jose Castillo in 2007, you were 43 fights unbeaten. Everything was going great. Had you experienced any kind of mental health issues up to that point? No, I don't think I, I had. I think there was always something hovering on the, on the, on the surface because... I used to, my, my first year, for example, I had nine fights in my first year, which pretty means you live in the gym every day. You know what I mean? You know, I, I couldn't, I mean, I'm sure people thought I lived in the pub every day when I was, but I mean, if you think about it, nine fights in 12 months, that means you lived in the gym. And I went, you know, long periods where I wasn't seeing me, me mates that I went to school with, me best mates, you know, like that. And I, used, I was starting to appear on Sky TV, me, me fights and that, you know. And I used to just, you know, be walking down through through Hyde or something like that and they go oh here he is the superstar and which they were saying it because because they were proud of me but I was thinking to myself do they think I'm getting too big for my boots do they think I'm getting a little bit on the cocky side here because I've been on the TV a few times and then I used to think you know I've not seen me I've not seen me mates I've not seen the duck I've not seen Wes I've not seen Sai I've not seen Steve for 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 like five months I bet they think I've gone too big time me so I, and I used to I used to sort of like have to go to the pub, even if I just had an orange juice in my training, just to say hello to them, just to make sure that they, you know, they, that they didn't think I'd got too big for my station. Which that, in many respects, is pathetic, really. They, 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 they know me from from day one, and they know, that, that, but that's what I had in my head. Oh, I've got to go and see the lads. I've got to go and see the lads. I don't want them thinking I'm getting too big for my station. You know what I mean? And and that, if you think about it, Mike, it's a bit of a a weak a confidence. Something's missing confidently wise, you know. I, they should know my mates, they love me anyway, so you know, it doesn't matter how long they go, they know I'm busy training, but I couldn't get it in my head. And I think that was, I think that was there from day one. I think that was there from day one, yeah. So, <clears throat> talk me through the moment that you realized that you did have mental health problems. When did things start to unfold? Well, I think it was around the time when I got beat by Mayweather because, um, as you had said there, you know, I had. Um, 43 fights up to Cast the Castillo fight and then I fought Floyd Mayweather and you know I I went over there I told all them fans I said I'm going to go over there and I'm going to beat him I'm going to beat this fella you know I wasn't over there just you know for the biggest payday because it was Floyd Mayweather I generally generally thought I was going to beat him and when I said to people I'm going to beat this fella um, I believed it and you know when I when I when I didn't and the manner in which it was where I was f frustrated after the fight because I thought the referee didn't really give me a fair crack of the whip I'm not saying I'd have beat him anyway but I thought you know he's you know you're from me you're from Vegas he's from Vegas and it's showing here because you're not letting me near him so and then after that I, co I come back to Hyde and I, I couldn't um, I couldn't walk down the street I couldn't walk down the street because I felt like people were laughing at me you know cancelled all my my functions all my engagements cancelled all my engagements and I, I said I just don't want to do it now no I'm embarrassed I'm embarrassed and people you know doesn't matter how many people at the time said, God, it was Floyd Mayweather. You know, he's probably going to go down as one of the best of all time. 
didn't matter to me. I didn't want to show my face. And that was the start of, 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 of things. I think it was always in the background, how I mentioned earlier, how weak I was and, you know, oh, I hope my mates don't think I'm above my station. But I think that's when it, it started, you know, and I think I speak for everybody, you know, it just, you know, it starts like that. But then once the ball starts rolling, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it, it just basically went on from there. So the, the defeat you could handle, letting people down in your mind, which you never did, but that was an issue for you. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know, when you think 40,000 fans came over and it's it's reassuring now that, you know, I'm past them thinking them kind of things now. But, you know, when it mustn't be a day that goes past when I've got one person that come up to me and say, oh, I remember the Vegas days, Rick. Oh, they were good days, you know. So, um, you know, it... So I look back now, I'd say, at Pride, but then at the time, no, I was... Uh, and don't forget, you've won 43 times and won three, four world titles in that time, you know what I mean? And beat Costa Zoo when he's stool and that, you know what I mean? And then you get beat for the first time. I think the, the last time I got beat as an amateur when I was, I, was, I was like 16. So there's a lot of years where I've been used to this success, used to this success, big crowd, big occasion, and I got knocked out for the first time. I thought... I just couldn't, uh, I could, couldn't deal with it. Couldn't deal with it very well, you know. And it's, you know, and you're getting knocked out in front. Of, when you fight someone like Mayweather, you get knocked out in front of the whole world, aren't you? And you know, because I felt a little bit weak-minded right from day one. You know, no, I didn't cope very well with it at all. No. That said, you did come back from that and you won again. But then there was the heavy defeat, of course, to Manny Pacquiao, and that was the moment really when things really did start to spiral out of control for you, didn't they? Yeah, well, it started around May with a fight, and then um, a lot of people were uh, saying, go on, Ricky, come back, and I come back. City of Manchester Stadium fight was my next one, and it wasn't my best performance against Juan Lascano, and people were starting to say, oh, you're finished, you passed it. And then I fell out with Billy Graham, um, which who was my best friend, and, you know, we had a you know, disagreement. He was your trainer, yeah. Who was my trainer and my best friend, and... Um, you know, and it's sort of like, and then, so then I was down again, and then then I thought Paulie Malinaji, Nolan and Liam carried the belt in, and a best performance since Costa Zoo, so I was back up mentally, and then I got beat by Pacquiao, and then I was back down again. So my mind, my frame of mind was was yo-yoing. One minute I'm all right, one minute I'm not, and then ultimately I, I had to retire after the Pacquiao fight, and then when I retired, I, I fell uh, I fell out with my mum and dad as well. You know, so. Uh, at that stage, I didn't care whether I lived or died, who I was with, what I was doing, you know what I mean? That that was in the paper. The only thing I could ask for was a bit of sympathy that I was very, very poorly. I didn't know where I was, what I was doing, who I was with. It was just real, real horrid times trying to kill myself on, on several occasions. But um, and that's, that's how bad it got. I used to think, well... I'm not celebrating it with my mum and dad, who's been there from day one. I'm not celebrating with Billy Graham, who's been in my corner every step of the way. I can't box no more, which is my main passion. What 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 am I doing here on earth? What am I do? What do I? What, what's the point of me living? And that's that's how I felt, and it was bad bad times, you know, for a short period there. You've mentioned very sadly those numerous suicide attempts. Do you remember your lowest ebb? Would you share that with us? Yeah, I um. One of the it was it was on several occasions and just each time I did it when it went a little bit worse a little bit worse a little bit worse and then you know in the end I would I was nearly piercing my skin you know the the skin was and I was I just I just could not do it and it was this, is with, a, this was with a knife yeah there yeah, were a knife the frustration of it was actually with a Stanley knife you know because family family trade the carpet fits is what they are I, I got a Stanley knife and I was go on, go on please do it Rick. you can do it and I, I never could so in the end uh, I thought to myself I'm never going to be able to do this because this was on numerous occasions and I thought well I'm just going to drink myself to death so I, ju I just kept going out and just drinking and drinking and drinking obviously the more more I drank then I started taking drugs so I could drink even more you know and it just went like that and it was heartbreaking period, you know, I mean, you know, like me going in the pub on my own, sat in the corner just crying and you could see all the regulars and all thinking, oh my, look at Rick, what is, what's happening here? And it was, uh, it was, it was, it was terrible times and, um, yeah. So how did you turn it around, Ricky? Did, did somebody step in to try to help you? Did you spot well, they, it yourself? They, tried, they tried to step in. I was with my, my ex, Jennifer, at the, at the time and, you know, whenever I was with... I was training boxers at the time, so whenever I'd come to the gym, I'd put a few jokes in and smile and that, and then I'd, I'd go home and, you know, 
I'd be speaking to Jennifer, Jennifer and acting of normal, but then whenever the boxers disappeared or Jennifer disappeared, I was I was I was I was in a bad state. I was doing it as if to it's like a smoke screen, trying to let everyone know, oh, I'm all right when I'm not, because I'm Ricky Hatton. I don't want to tell everyone if I'm, I'm crying and I feel like, you know, feel like terrible every day and everything like that. And that's how people with mental health generally feel, especially men. So you can imagine our world champion, you know, when he's crying and everything, I can't go to my girlfriend or my mates or the boxers and say, hey, I'm crying here, I need help. I couldn't do it. And that's how it went considerably worse. But... Uh, I think I think it was when Millie was born, my second baby, my second love, my, my baby boy, uh, my baby girl, beg your pardon. When she was born, she wasn't planned, uh, and Jennifer fell pregnant. And then I held her in my arms at the hospital one day, and I thought, "Come on, Ricky, it's not about you. It's about you know your family now and getting things right, and providing for them." You know, I had Campbell, obviously, a little cracker, but Millie had come along, and I thought, "Get it together." And I even then struggled, and then I went to see a psychiatrist and I just fell on my knees in the office and I just said, listen, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to kill myself and there's nothing that's going to... I can't stop it. I'm not strong enough. You've got to help me. And bit by bit, I kept going for treatment a couple of times a week, kept telling me things I need, I need to do and things I need to do and stuff like that. And it basically, bit by bit, it got better and better and better. And that's... Um, and that was back then when you know, I mean, Frank Bruno went through a, a bad uh, time when he was when he was sectioned, and I went through a, a, a real horrific time. And back then, you know, it was it was worse for Frank, but for me, they turned around and said it's medicine. Medicine you've got to stay clear of because medicine makes you feel better just for that couple of hours while you take it. It's like when you have a beer. You feel depressed, you have a beer, you feel great, but then it wears off, it's worse. And medicine was the same, so that's what I've been trying to bang the drum, to doing it through boxing now and exercise, letting some endorphins off, you know, letting off a little bit bit of steam. And there's nothing better to, to do it than, than than boxing. I mean, if you go to the gym, go on the running machine or the, the, the rower or anything like that, you know, when we finally get our backside off the couch and go to the gym, we feel 10 feet tall after, don't we? We feel, oh, glad I've done that. And, you know, it's not more so than boxing. And uh, and that's how I've I've found to to turn it to turn it round by doing positive things. You know what I mean? Thinking about the good things I've got rather than the negatives. And it's 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 very very hard for a man and a former world champion to do to admit that I'm I'm crying every day. It was bad. Indeed, and and you were so brave in the ring for many many years. But was opening up about this and getting help perhaps the most courageous thing you've ever done? I think it probably was, yeah. I mean, because, uh, you know, I, I was a no-nonsense fighter. You know, I'll, I'll move up a weight, I'll fight Costa Zoo and Pacquiao was knocking everyone out. I don't care, I'll, I'll fight him. And that was what I was, um, that's what I was um, was all about. But um, when it when it come to, um, when it come to what was going on between my ears, it doesn't matter what I could do in that boxing ring. I, uh, no, I, I really, really struggled and, you know, and that's what I like to think, you know, in telling this story, people would say, I can't believe that. I can't believe Ricky Hatton, who fought every every man and his dog, if you like, you know, can't believe Ricky Hatton felt like that. I said, well, if, you know, if I, if I can and can come back from it, I'm not scared of admitting it. Nobody else should, you know what I mean? And uh, I think the more people that open up, admit it, get it off the chest and speak to it, I think the more lives we'll save. And I think a lot of people with mental health are coming round to that way of thinking now a few years ago if you said you had mental health everyone thought you'd lost the plot but now people just you've banging the drum you've got to get you've got to get it off your chest and i think we're i think we're in a better people with mental health are in a better position now because of knowing how to deal with it i guess i'm guessing it still requires a lot of work on your part how do you manage this day to day now well sometimes i get up in the morning and um i just feel rubbish mentally rubbish mentally tired and uh, nothing's happened you know what I mean I, I could have had my me, me girls round you know for, for tea the night before I had a good laugh you know I had a laugh and a joke with them and a play in the garden and then you know woke up in the morning and I think how is that possible <laughs> what's happened there and I find um, when I have you know I, I, I put my gloves on and it go and do the bit, bit of exercise I hit the punch bag you know what I mean lay off a little bit of steam or if it's a nice you know, it's a nice day. I'll get on the road and I'll go running out, and the sun's shining and everything like that. And then I'll come back. You know, have a have a have a bath or a shower, have a cup of tea, sit down, and I'll start flicking through my phones at my pictures of my kids and stuff like like that. And um, and it puts me right back on. It puts me right back on track. You know, and nine nine times out of ten, 
that it works. It works for me. It works for me. It's just doing something positive. I mean, but you've you've got to you've got to you've got to make the conscious effort to do it. You know what I mean? You sit. The longer you sit there, the worse you go. You know, I think, oh, it's going to be one of them days here today. Come on, get out and get doing something. And that's, that's, what, that's what I do. Or if you know, I'm having a bit of a bad day, I'd sit down from Jennifer. Jennifer, can I have the kids for a few hours? Yep, yeah, okay. Puts me back on track. You've got to do things, you know. But if you're sitting there feeling sorry for yourself, and, you know, you should feel sorry for yourself because you've got an illness like any other. But you, the longer you sit there feeling sorry for yourself, the worse you go, I find. And I think I've got to get off me, me bum and do some, put something to it. I put Oasis on. I watch. I watch. You know, city, you know, a, a, a City United game or a, a city, sorry, the six-one game or something like that, or just something, just to to get me back going. And and it and it works. It works. For, it works for me anyway. Is music a, a big help to you? Is there is there a go-to song or a go-to artist? Is it Oasis? Is there a particular song? Um, there's there's so many. Um, there's one that sticks in my head. It was an Elvis song. If you can dream, if I can dream, and uh, I remember one the night before the box cost you zoo. They put like an hour special on uh, for the for the pre-fight build-up, if you like. And at the at the end of it, they they showed um, a video of me boxing as an amateur, and then as me just turning pro, and then me winning my first title, and then you know me me me, me coming through and. And it was like, if I can dream, you know, it was, it was, it was brilliant. And I sat there watching it, and I was just, and it just got me so pumped up. So I always, I always have that on my phone. I always put that because it reminds me of my greatest uh, ever moment, or any real uh, Oasis, Oasis song. You know, the one at the Liam, at Liam at the minute, which is a good one for me. You only get to do it once. That's a good one for me because that's life, really. It's not feeling, you know, you've got to do it once. Some people didn't get the chance to do it once, but you only, you've got, to, you know, and it's just little things, you know, like that that just put me, put me back on, uh, back on track. And I think, uh, I think that would be the case for most people if 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 they try and go by that. I mean, it might not always work. And if it, if it doesn't work, you need to get off your bum and go and see someone, go and see someone professionally and speak to and get it off your chest. But nine times out of ten, that works for me. I know that that glory period is over now. There is a new chapter. And I know you still get your kicks from the after dinner circuit and as a trainer now here in the gym. How important is mental well-being with the boxers you're working with now? Well, it is really because I mean, and I've, I I look at lads when they come in if they're having a bad day, and I, I tell them that I tell them this story about how bad I was and I used to come to the gym and I used to hide it away from my boxers and, and, and stuff like that. And I'd say to him, I say, listen, he said, I say to my boxers, my job is to try and get you the best fights I can, you know, and get you to the best condition and the best shape you are in so you can perform best. But I said, my, I'm not going to get you in shape. I said, if, you, if when you leave these four walls of the gym, you're going back home, and your family life, your personal life, something's going wrong in, in there, you know, it's, you're going to suffer in here. So I said, you know, look at me, not just as your boxing trainers, look at me as like a bit of a father figure in this sense, because whatever problems you've gone through for me since, uh, I've probably gone through it, you know. As, there's nothing I can tell you about boxing that, I, that, you know, that I don't know. And to be honest, there's nothing about, there's probably nothing I can really... It's nothing that I've not experienced from the other side of, of it. And it's all connected. You're going to be the best you can be if, you, if you're happy and strong up there. I'm going to get the best out of you in here. So I expect you, you, expect you as me being part of your coach, that you tell me everything that's going wrong with your life, you know, get it, you know and get it off your chest. And I think that's what makes, I'd like to think, make me, a, a, you know, a, a decent trainer. You know, because, I mean... There's nothing I can't tell them from a boxing point of view, but for me, for me sins, for me faults, you know, I've been able, I've experienced most things from the other side as well. So uh, never be scared. If I'm telling the story, never be scared of coming to me and saying, Rick, this has happened, that's happened. And I've, I think that's why I have a closeness to all my fighters. You know what I mean? I'm not just like the trainer there that gives them a wipe down and puts the gum shield in them. They, they look at me as the mate, and that's exactly what I am. And I think that's what the more we we can do to our mates, keep an eye on them and, you know, let them know if, well, if anything happens and your comes in your direction, please come to me and don't feel ashamed. Because I'm an ambassador now for Frank Bruno. 
the Frank Bruno Foundation, you know, on, on mental health. I see my sportsman's dinners, as you mentioned before there, mate. I, I see that as much as my job, not just telling them about me, me, me wins and losses and my boxing career, but just telling them how I've come through the bad times and how I did it. That's an important thing to me now. My, I see my job as an ambassador for mental health and training the boxers in the gym. And uh, I think it makes me feel better going talking about it. And seeing people say, oh, that's inspiring me, Ricky, that story. I can't believe you felt like that. That gives me my little, my little buzz now, yeah. I've got to ask you about this year. 2020 has been such a difficult year for all of us. When coronavirus reared its head in March and we went into lockdown, were you concerned at that point that this might derail you? Uh, very much so, especially um, the first couple of weeks because the... Uh, I was sat in, you know, live on me, live on my own, and they were talking about, you know, you can't have people from other households coming in. So I was thinking, you know, I'm not going to see me, I'm not going to see me kids. I'm not going to see Campbell or Millie or Fern or Lila. I thought this is going to be a nightmare. So I was having a little drink in the in the house, and then it, it got to the where I found myself three days on the bounce. I was drunk, and then I was eating rubbish and everything like that. And I could see myself putting weight on and. I thought this isn't going to be. This isn't good. This week. This isn't good for you. you. Worked so hard to get yourself, your life in a position where we, where I got it to, where we were talking about. And then sadly, my my cousin um, hung himself. Um, he had mental health problems, and he hung himself. So uh, I went. I went really, really quite in a in a in a bad way. So I. Uh, but then I got myself together. I said, "Listen, Rick. You know, Stephen's in a position that we can't do anything." You know, but you're in a position where you can do something and practice what you preach. Pick the phone up and speak to someone. Picked up the phone, spoke to someone, said, what am I doing, this, that. I went, we could be here for three months. I don't know what I'm going to do. He said, Ricky, he went, I've been with you for seven years, eight years, ten years, whatever it is. And I tell you what, you used to do 12 weeks training camp with you. He said, what did you do with 12 weeks? I went, I don't know what you mean. He went, you didn't have a drink, <laughs> you didn't eat fat foods, you dieted, you trained every day and you stayed away from your mates and your family and your loved ones. He went, yeah. So he went, well, why don't you do the same, Rick? Why don't you do the same? He said, he said, you can even have a little drink. You don't have to diet. You know what I mean? You've got FaceTime now where you can FaceTime your kids. It's not, this is not going to be as bad as your training camps were. You do it then, do it now. And that's what I did. I started training every day, running every day, training every day, hitting the bag. And then I was very fortunate that I was able to see Millie and Fern because I could go from different households because they were at the age um, they were. And uh, I've not stopped, not looked back. I mean, I'm never, I'm never gonna, I'm always gonna be a bit of a chunky monkey, as they, as they, as they say, because I dieted all my life, so I don't have to diet. But. Um, I think as long as I can just keep healthy in body, healthy in mind, and you know, and keep that keep that belly away, you know what I mean. Uh, it's, it's and it's been good for me. So it's I be honest, I'm I'm blessed. I mean, so many people must have found it so hard. And even if you haven't got mental health problems, I bet there's a few that have ended up with them because it's been so so difficult for everyone. But I feel blessed that because of my mental health, I was able to cope with it better than most. You know what I mean, and. Uh, I used it to me to me advantage, yeah. I know you've built some bridges now, you've made friends with the people you fell out with, your friends with Billy Graham, your former trainer now, and with your parents. Is life good now? It's, you know, I mean, it's it's, it's better than it's ever been. And I know people say, well, that's a bit, bit of a, a bold statement because, you know, you you were fighting in Vegas and you were winning world titles and, and stuff like that. But, I mean, I'm saying that because I know how bad it was at the bad times. So I like lifting them belts, but I'll tell you what, them bad times, I didn't think I was going to pull through it. And, um, you know, when I looked to myself, you know, I finally threw myself in front of someone on my knees and said, listen, I'm going to kill myself. I said, I can't do this on my own. I really desperately need help. That was the greatest day of my life because we turned me, I turned my life around. And you talk about there, you know, I mean, if I had have killed myself around at that time, I wouldn't have made up with Billy and having the great times that we're having together. I wouldn't have seen my beautiful Lila, my beautiful granddaughter. I wouldn't have seen Millie and Fern develop into the young, young girls that they're developing. And I wouldn't see Campbell progressing his boxing career like he's doing as well. I, I'd, and I wouldn't have had so many... Great, the last four years since I made up with my mum and dad, Christmases are better and better and New Year's are better and better. And I nearly said goodbye to all that, you know, so, um, and that's because I just got it off my chest, threw it up, started looking after myself a little bit better, doing positive things rather than sulking about the past. And uh, I've never looked back since, mate. Finally, 
what would you say to anybody out there that's watching this? What advice would you give if they have mental health problems? I just, what I've just said there, you know, you know, you know, tomorrow's another day. You've got to look at it. You know what I mean? Don't look about next week. Don't look about, just look about tomorrow. Get yourself tomorrow. And the best way you can get yourself by, out by tomorrow is getting off your backside, just doing something positive. You know, what do you like doing? I like listening to Oasis, or I like watching football, or I like watching boxing, or I like doing stuff like stuff like that. Or we've all got phones now. Go through your diary. Go through your, your, your photos in your phone and look at all the good times with your kids and your family and this and that and all the rest of it. And just get, get, go, out, go for a run or go for a walk. Everyone seems to be walking these days now, here, there and everywhere. Go on, go for a run, go for a walk, do something positive. Or get to get a bag put up in the garage and not lumps out of him. And it'll make, it'll make you feel better about yourself, you know what I mean? Get blowing off a, a little bit of steam. And if you're getting through that day, you know what I mean? You know, tomorrow's always another day. Tomorrow's always another day. And you think tomorrow's gonna go through, you know, Tomorrow's going to be like today, and then today's going to be like yesterday, and you know, no, just get through, just get through the day by doing positive things, and tomorrow the world will look brighter again. Good advice there, Ricky. It's great to see you looking so well and talking so positively. And here we are now, eight years since you hung up the boxing gloves, still inspiring people. Thank you very much. Pleasure, mate.